coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. NCBA's efforts in Washington, D.C. help protect the business climate for cattlemen and women all across the country. We're in our nation's capital to learn more about how NCBA works for you. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. When we ask producers about the value of NCBA, one of the first answers they give is how the organization provides a strong voice in our nation's capital on behalf of the beef cattle industry. So today, we're at NCBA's Washington, D.C. office to get some insight into the work being done here each and every day. We start with a closer look at why it's important for NCBA to have boots on the ground right here in our nation's capital. When you're busy taking care of your land, your cattle, and your family, it's easy to leave aside all the things happening away from the farm or ranch. The fact is what happens in Washington, D.C. from legislation in Congress to regulations from a government agency can dramatically impact your livelihood. What goes on on a national level is vitally important to what happens to every single one of us, that we have to have a voice in Washington. You have to have somebody like NCBA. When NCBA is up there representing us, when I, I'm here, Kevin Heffers, taking care of cattle on the operation, and we have bills in Washington, D.C., or we're negotiating the farm bill, they're there making sure that our policy that we drove forward is enacted and carried forward in those bills. They also are there protecting us from WOTUS, Waters of the U.S. NCBA's Washington office is located right on Pennsylvania Avenue, and from here, Ethan Lane and the D.C. team keep an eye on anything Congress and the federal government might do that affects NCBA members and the beef cattle industry. One of the main reasons I'm an NCBA member is because of the lobbying effort that they do in Washington, D.C. I don't really have the time or desire to be a lobbyist or work with the government officials and you know you're in a member so that you have representation you know with the government and to keep our best interests in mind the ncba washington office is staffed by professionals with the skills to tackle any issue from animal health to trade and from taxes to environmental regulation they fight every day for the interests of cattle producing families and they work to head off legislation or regulations that could negatively impact the business climate for beef cattle producers in every state. In Washington, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. And joining us now is Danielle Beck. She's NCBA's Senior Executive Director of Government Affairs. Danielle, thanks for coming to the show. Thank you for having me. Let's start by talking about this office itself. Why is it so important to have a physical presence here in Washington, D.C.? You know, if you turn on the news, you will realize that there's quite a lot happening here in Washington, D.C. and in our nation's capital. You know, as the nation's oldest and largest trade association representing U.S. cattle producers, we strive each and every day to be the voice of the U.S. cattle industry here in Washington. Uh, we unfortunately have to often fight back a host of bad ideas, but I, I j joke with our members that I live in Washington, D.C., along with the rest of this office so that they don't have to. And we strive each and every day to ensure that their voice is represented, whether it's pushing forward good policy that will benefit this industry or fighting back some of those kooky bad ideas. And we really appreciate that. Now, the Senate recently passed the $1.5 trillion omnibus to continue funding the government. Were there some specific wins for the beef cattle industry in that bill? Absolutely. Uh, first, you know, there was a reauthorization of livestock mandatory reporting. That's something that's really critical for this industry, and we were happy to see that continued. Uh, we also saw several different policy riders maintained that have been really critically important for the industry. So the electronic logging device, or ELD, uh, waiver, so that that isn't implemented for livestock haulers, that was maintained. Uh, several different really important environmental uh, greenhouse gas reporting riders, mm -hmm. and then uh, on top of that, we saw the authorization of a cattle contract library pilot program, mm -hmm. which we think will be really helpful uh, to the whole conversation about cattle markets. Let's talk taxes for just a minute. What are the kinds of things that NCBA does on behalf of beef cattle producers as it relates to taxes? 
We work really hard to educate uh, members of Congress and their staff about the changes in the tax code that will really impact this industry. Uh, whether you are t talking about your annual tax burden or your ability to pass your operation on to the next generation of producers, we believe that the tax code plays a really critical role. And unfortunately, at the beginning of this administration, there were a host of different bad ideas, uh, really looking to, I think, ultimately build back better on the backs of our cattle producers. And so we fought really hard to ensure that provision like stepped up basis, uh, section 1031 like kind exchanges, uh, you know, the 199A small business deduction, all of those really critical provisions in the tax code were maintained. Yeah. So let's talk about some of these bad tax proposals. I mean, I'm not sure if there's a good tax proposal or not, but tell us about specifically what you do to fight back against some of those bad taxes. Yeah. So we rely on data. Uh, we were really grateful that there were several different land grant studies on the issue of repealing stepped up basis specifically mm -hmm. that spoke to the impact it would have on this industry. So one study in particular indicated that our industry, cattle producers, agricultural producers across the board, would see an average one-time tax burden of roughly $700,000 if the administration were to repeal stepped-up basis. Uh, we used those talking points, that data on Capitol Hill, but we also relied upon our membership, our cattle producers, to engage with their members of Congress as well. And we engaged in a, a really great grassroots advocacy campaign that was incredibly effective. That's really encouraging. Let's talk fake meat for a minute. I've been really encouraged to see that, that frankly, that product has not been gaining the marketplace at attraction or traction that, that uh, they once thought. Uh, tell us about some key wins here in Washington, D.C. as it relates to fake meat. Yeah. So we are continuing to see USDA and the uh, Food and Drug Administration move forward on the oversight of cell cultured products. Uh -huh. These products aren't available in the grocery store just yet. Uh, cell cultured, lab grown, they're not really sure what to call it and they're not really sure what to regulate or how to regulate it. Right. Uh, but we have been fighting for USDA to play a primary oversight role every step of the way because we know that their oversight is really going to ensure, or the best way to ensure, a fair, even playing field for our producers to compete upon. Uh, just a few months ago, USDA closed a comment period relative to the labeling of these products. Okay. Uh, that is the first step in a longer process. But NCBA was one of the first uh, organizations to comment, and we used data from a consumer survey that we had conducted in 2020 one, the most important part of this data is the fact that consumers, when asked to rank different terms, believe that lab grown is the easiest to understand. And more than 75% of respondents in our consumer survey believe that these products absolutely need to be differentiated in the grocery store. So uh, that was our clear message to USDA. Don't call it beef, yep. differentiate it in the market. And if you're going to use a term, use one that's easy to understand so consumers can make the right purchasing decisions. I love it. There's still more work to be done. What are the next steps? So right now we're just waiting to see what happens between USDA and FDA. Uh, we are going to be pivoting towards uh, Capitol Hill, working with our allies in both chambers on the Real Meat Act. Uh, there was a great bill last Congress. We need to see that reintroduced, and we're looking to maybe make some tweaks and build upon uh, the groundwork that we did last Congress to see uh, improvements made to that end. Some critically important issues you're working on. Thank you for all that you do on behalf of all of us in the country. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to support the beef industry, why not become a member of NCBA? By doing so, you'll be sustaining the work of NCBA in defending and advocating for the cattle industry in Washington, D.C. It's easy to do. Just call 866-233-3872, or you can visit the website ncba.org. When we return, we'll dig deeper into the work NCBA does in Washington, D.C. to protect cattle producing families. Animal health and the cattle markets are just some of the many issues we'll touch on. Matt Makins here from this week's Weather Watch, watching those ocean conditions as La Nina begins to weaken in some cases. What does that mean for the atmosphere as we head throughout April? The temperature and precipitation outlook straight ahead. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to the cows. They will not eat them. Or if they do eat them, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and my pillow. 
Well, during these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my standard size MyPillow, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size MyPillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98. Or my king size, regular $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm gonna include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. One of NCBA's strongest advocacy tools in Washington is the NCBA Political Action Committee. And joining us now with a closer look into the NCBA PAC is Ethan Lane, Vice President of Government Affairs at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Ethan, tell us a little bit about the NCBA PAC and the specific goals of the PAC. So the PAC is an important tool for our producers to donate, contribute money towards support for candidates that have this industry's back in Washington, D.C. The goal of the PAC is to identify those members of Congress who support this industry, who share our ideals, share our vision, have producers in their, in their districts that, that raise cattle and, and are part of that economic footprint, and, and make sure that those members have the money they need to, to run for Congress in what is an increasingly expensive political environment. You know, there are all kinds of outside groups and, and, and uh, you know, folks that don't want to see the cattle industry succeed mm-hmm. that are wading into these races. So it's important that these members of Congress know that we support those members that support us throughout the United States. So what would you say is the overall importance of the pack to the broader beef industry? What does it really do to the, the, the broad section of the beef industry? It makes sure that we have a voice in that political process. You know, we have a voice in the policy process. We're up on, on Capitol Hill, we're talking about legislation, we're providing technical input. This is the political side. This is where we wade into those political races and we look at candidates and we interview them. We have them come into this office mm-hmm. and we talk about whether they share our perspective, whether they are as invested in the success of the U.S. cattle industry as we are. And we look for those candidates to say, you know what, they've earned the support of our members mm-hmm. in, in, in the form of a, of a ch- contribution to their political action committee that allows them to you know, have television ads and, and yard signs and, and do all those things they have to do to run for Congress, right. uh, to make sure that we have members of Congress up here uh, who are really looking at our industry as, as a future uh, for, for rural America and making sure that they are really looking out for those priorities that we have here in the industry. Now, you always have a special event going on right now now uh, here at the office. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like. You bet. We host a lot of events here uh, in the in the office here in Washington, D.C. for members of Congress, uh, fundraising events where different agricultural commodity organizations and others who support those candidates can come mm-hmm. and, and get together, talk about the issues, talk about the campaign, mm-hmm. and, and show some support for a specific candidate. Right now, we're doing what we call a farm team event. This is for multiple members of the House Agriculture Committee. So these are these are folks that are, that are bedrock champions yeah. of U.S. agriculture are bedrock champions of the U.S. cattle industry. I mean, these are the people that we, they're, they're our first calls yeah. when, when, when things need to get done in Washington. Um, so we want to make sure they understand uh, that our members are there to support them, that we've got their back in these tough election cycles, uh, and that we're invested in their success. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to uh, take in the views of Washington. We're going to have some, uh, some pretty high quality beef up there, um, and we're going to celebrate those, those members that are always looking out for our best interest up on Capitol Hill. And why is it so important to build those kind of relationships here in D.C.? Well, you know, I, I think people sometimes mistakenly think that, you know, it's kind of a, a dirty money game. And, and look, it's important to support candidates that support us. Yes. But that's the beginning of the process, right? Those are those are the initial conversations. The relationships are built over years of working together and building trust on policy issues and a lot of other interactions. This is one way that we express that support by showing them that we have their back on the campaign side, too. You know, there's a, there's a lot of members that we work with that we don't donate to that we have great relationships with as well. So it's all part of the process up here, but this is one really important tool to make sure that we're getting members of Congress up here on Capitol Hill that really understand what we need. So for viewers who want to know more about the NCBA PAC, where do they go? Policy.ncba.org. That's going to give you all the information you need on the PAC, 
our issue positions, everything DC office focused and uh, in, in NCBA land you can find on that website. Thank you so much for coming to the show and shedding some light on NCBA's PAC. We appreciate it. You bet. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the important work of NCBA's PAC, then visit policy.ncba.org for more details. The volatile cattle markets continue to be a concern for producers, and it's something NCBA is working hard to address right here in Washington, D.C. Joining me now is Tanner Beamer, NCBA's Director of Government Affairs and Market Regulatory Policy. Tanner, thanks for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I think it's fair to say that uh, producers have been both confused and frustrated about the cattle markets uh, most recently. And I'm curious, uh, what is NCBA doing to address this issue? You know, complex problems often require complex solutions, right? And that's what we've been focused on for the last two years through multiple iterations of working groups with our members, policy making process at the Live Cattle Marketing Committee. And ultimately, what I like to say is we, we focus on three legs of the same stool, right? If, if improving the cattle market situation is the seat, then those three legs to prop it up are price discovery, processing capacity, and market transparency. And we've seen a lot of good progress on all three of those fronts over the last several years. Our voluntary efforts to increase negotiated trade uh, seem to be very successful, particularly down in the Southern Plains where we have more negotiated trade for better price discovery. On the processing capacity side of the equation, uh, USDA has announced that they're going to be investing about $1 billion uh, into small regional processing facilities that are uh, more niche in focus and tailored towards some of those regional markets. And we're very pleased to see that. And we're excited to see them start to announce the details of how some of those funds will be distributed. Mm -hmm. And then on the market transparency front, we've been uh, very adamant about getting livestock mandatory reporting reauthorized through Congress for a full five years. We're currently operating under a temporary extension and then looking for ways to improve upon that program. So it works as an even more robust tool for cattle producers to know what's going on in the market at any given time. Part of that, uh, is, is on our efforts to advocate for a cattle contract library, but also just more robust reporting of the existing information that we have available at USDA. Outstanding update. And you mentioned Live Cattle Marketing Committee. You serve as the staff liaison to that committee. Is that right? That is. And uh, you all had a meeting in Houston. Uh, tell us a little bit about the outcomes of that meeting. Yeah, uh, the Live Cattle Marketing Committee is just one of the policy committee meetings that met during our convention in Houston. Uh, but it was a very lively discussion. We had to figure out kind of how we wanted to approach some of the legislation that's pending on Capitol Hill. And ultimately what happened is we didn't really change our position on any of the existing legislation. We just reaffirmed that we need to be uh, advocating for some additional transparency. We need to be advocating for additional education tools for producers. Um, but in the context of all of that, we do not want the government to be picking winners and losers in the cattle markets uh, via mandates on cash trade. Uh, so that was one of the outcomes of the meeting. Uh, we had some working groups that delivered reports on how we can go about achieving some better market transparency. Uh, and we adopted some policies that allow us to go and uh, pursue some of those outcomes. And you mentioned the recent um, uh, legislation that actually approve funding for the cattle contract library. Tell us more about that. That's right. So the fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill included in it a one-time appropriation to USDA to establish a cattle contract library pilot program. Okay. So that allows USDA to study the program, to tee it up and play around with it a little bit, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then report their findings back to Congress in the hopes that if we ever were to get a permanent cattle contract library, we already have some experience with what works works and what doesn't. One key difference in this particular pilot program, though, is that it would direct the library to the Livestock, Poultry, and Grain Market News Division of USDA, rather than the Packers and Stockyards Division, where the Swine Contract Library is currently teed up. And one of the reasons that's important is because the Market News Division, they're the ones that implement livestock mandatory reporting. They're the ones that are well experienced in aggregating complex data sets into a user-friendly uh, format, mm -hmm. but also handling confidential information in a way that is not going to disclose proprietary business information. One thing we've learned the last couple of years, there's a lot of black swan events that can create a lot of volatility for cattle producers. And whether that be the pandemic or whether that be issues of the, the packing plant fire or even traditional droughts that come along every now and again, I'm curious, what is NCBA doing to ensure that livestock producers have some of the tools they need to manage that risk? You know, we are in constant communication with our partners at the CME Group, at the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, uh -huh. trying to make sure that the live and feeder cattle futures 
futures contracts continue to be a good way for producers to hedge against some of this inherent risk that we've seen in the marketplace, uh, particularly with the black swan events that you just mentioned, but also for the ones that we have not yet uh, seen or noticed. Uh, another way that we are advocating for our producers from a risk management perspective, uh, we're beginning the conversations about the next farm bill right yeah. now, yeah. and we wanna make sure that some of those crop insurance programs like the Livestock Risk Protection Program or the Pasture Rangeland and Forage Program yeah. uh, continue to receive robust funding and continue to be useful tools for our producers. Ultimately, we wanna make sure that if you want to implement a risk management strategy on your operation mm -hmm. to help hedge against some of those black swan events, you have the tools at your disposal to do so. Very good. Thank you so much for coming to the show. We'll have you back again. Thanks. Still ahead, we'll discuss the infrastructure bill and NCBA's efforts to get this important piece of legislation passed. We'll also have a weather update from meteorologist Matt Macon. So stay with us. We'll be right back. From the very beginning, Richie has been dedicated to one thing, helping people deliver fresh, constant water to their animals. Today's Ritchie waterers rely on a valve design that remains much the same as it was in 1921. It's a simple idea. Do it right and the rest will take care of itself. We never set out to create a company that would be around for a hundred years. We just wanted to create something great. This beef quality assurance tip is funded by the Beef Checkoff. Hi, this is Libby Bigler here to give you a beef quality assurance tip on record keeping. Record keeping is a key principle of beef quality assurance and in general, it's just a good business management practice. You'll often hear the statement that you can't manage what you don't measure. And in BQA terms, record keeping is the way that you can manage all of your animal performance indicators like reproductive status, health, age, and you can compare those things year over year to make better management decisions in the future. Record keeping doesn't have to be complicated, but in order for it to be useful, make sure that you keep accurate, timely, and thorough records. For more information about record keeping, you can always visit bqa.org. The Beef Quality Assurance Program is funded by the Beef Checkoff. Time now for Weather Watch with meteorologist Matt Makins. Welcome to another Weather Watch. This week we are tracking La Nina. It's going to garner quite a few headlines, uh, but I think the headlines are going to be a bit misleading. They're going to say that La Nina is weakening, and that is true. But that is classic. As we approach summer, La Nina, El Nino, they weaken. Their impact lessens as we get into summer. So as you read some headlines around or hear about them, La Nina, yes, it does weaken, but that is normal for every year. April temperatures, we'll chat about that as well as precipitation and drought changes with the start of the growing season. We need some substantial help in the drought department. We'll see where we'll get some help in just a moment. As far as La Nina, again, we're talking about sea surface temperatures. Are they colder or warmer than normal? They're colder than normal around the equatorial Pacific. And that is true. That's where La Nina comes from. And then that impacts the atmosphere above and creates a La Nina atmospheric pattern that we've been in two years in a row. We may make it three next year. But there's an area here just off of South America that's beginning to warm up. So that's indicating La Nina's strength as far as ocean conditions are weakening. Now, if you look at various areas of where La Nina lives, one region, two region, three region, four region, and a timeline here. Very, very pronounced La Nina, very cold here over the last several months. But we get most recently here on the far right, and we're seeing all of these charts start to trend upward. So we're trying to warm up that ocean. The ocean, as it warms up into summer, will mean that La Nina, as far as the ocean is concerned, is getting weaker. However, it does not appear that the atmosphere wants to change at all. It wants to send all our storm systems up to the Pacific Northwest, dive them down to the east, 
missing much of the country. So with that said, let's take a look at the April conditions, temperatures as well as precipitation. Now as far as temperatures, as storms come over the Pacific Northwest, diving south to the southeast and then curl back up the east coast, you're more likely to have the colder than normal temperatures in the northern plains. Uh, sections of the south may also be colder, but where the storms are missing, the southwest, certainly a very warm outlook for April. Now, as you look at precipitation, same idea. With an absence of storms, the west and the southwest stays very dry. The storms dive down to the south and east, grabbing some moisture. So there will be some wetness from the Midwest of the Ohio and the Tennessee valleys and the southeast and drier for the northeast. Now, with that outlook for April in mind, how do we change the drought? There will be some improved areas. This is the drought monitor. Bad across the west, don't expect improvement there, but we may see improvement around the Great Lakes, Upper Midwest, and the Southeast. Don't forget, the April edition of the Directions Magazine, the Spring Edition, is coming your way soon with a lot more information on the Spring Outlook. One big win for the beef industry in 2021 was the passing of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Here to talk more about this bill is NCBA's Executive Director of Government Affairs, Allison Rivera. Allison, tell us why this bill and what it contains was so important to the beef industry. Absolutely. So this was a very robust package, but there were a lot of really good pieces for the cattle industry in this in this bill. Yeah. Um, funding for roads and bridges is important. We've got to be able to move our livestock efficiently uh, and get those animals where they need to go. And I know that across the country, particularly in rural America, we have a lot of dilapidated roads and bridges that, that need to be fixed. And I think as Americans, we can all agree that infrastructure is important. We also saw rural broadband funding, which again is extremely important to our, our producers that want to be able to move at the speed of the marketplace. So mm -hmm. we've, we've got to make sure that we, that we get funds out to rural America. And then we had a big win in hours of service, that back end 150 air mile exemption that gives us flexibility in hours of service. I want to talk about each one of those just a little bit more. So let's talk roads and bridges. I think a lot of people don't recognize uh, just how poor many roads and bridges are when you get out to rural America. Why is that such a big issue? I mean, we saw issues this year where a bridge went down in, in rural parts of the Southeast and truckers were having to divert two hours mm. to, to get cattle where they needed to go. Right. We don't want to see stuff like that happen. We've got to be efficient. Yep. It affects the bottom line of producers and we've got to make sure that those cattle get safely where they need to go. So we've got to fix those dilapidated roads and bridges that haven't been addressed for 20 plus years. And you talk about connecting people, but one way we connect people, not just with roads and bridges, but also through high-speed internet. Tell us what that means. We've got to be able to keep up with the rest of the marketplace, right? Even in the middle of uh, in a, in a rural part of Nebraska or yeah. California, we've got to make sure that that last mile gets the internet speed that they need so that we can live anywhere in this country and stay up with the marketplace, be able to do the best we can as cattle producers and to make sure that we keep up uh, with, with everyone else in the country. And in order to do that, we've got to have high speed rural broadband access for everyone. That's really encouraging to me personally. And, and, and you mentioned hours of service. Uh, we've been fighting this for some time back in DC. What is this bill going to mean as it relates yeah. to the exemption? So we continue to fight for hours of service flexibility. That's the bottom line. We did get a, a, a big piece of that with another ag exemption. So to the destination of a haul with live cattle on the back, a hauler has another 172 road miles that okay. do not count against his hours of service for that day, which is 11 hours of drive time, 14 on duty and a 10 hour rest. That 10 hour rest is a mandated 10 hour rest. We simply cannot pull over uh, for 10 hours with a, right. with a load of cattle in the back. This allows somebody who 30 minutes from their destination to finish that haul uh, and it doesn't count towards their hours of service. So they have that flexibility in the back end that we already have on the front end of hauls. Very good. One last question for you. Why is it so important for NCB to have a strong membership base when you're working on bills like this big infrastructure bill? So we have senators and, uh, and house members from across the country, right? And each state has their own issues. And when we talk about infrastructure, each state has their own issues because of the diversity of the sure. state. So I think it was very important as we worked on this very large package to hear from individual cattle producers about what's going on in their state. What broadband needs did they have? What bridges are dilapidated in their counties and, and roads that they're trying to haul livestock on? So I think it was very important for those senators and house members to hear exactly what was going on in their states. and. At the end of the day, the states are going to have a lot of this money to decide how it's spent. So it's great for us to be able to hear from members so that we can send those messages back to the Hill and they can help their states to, to spend that money correctly. 
Very good. You know, from roads and bridges, uh, internet access, uh, just getting our livestock from point A to point B, all very practical issues and examples of why it's so important to have you and your team representing our interest here in this city. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Still to come, we'll have a closer look at how NCBA deals with animal welfare issues here in Washington. Stay with us. There's more of this special edition of Cattle and Cattlemen just ahead. These are the pennies it costs for Altisit IGR protection, making it one of the best values in the market designed specifically for fighting horn flies on pasture. As a supplement, Altisit IGR is part of what you're already doing. And as a feed through, what your cattle are always doing. Take shelter from the swarm for just two to three cents per animal per day. That's just 450 per animal per season for horn fly protection that has been performing for over 40 years with no known resistance. Altacid IGR. Cattle producers across the country work hard to care for their animals and their land. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is there to help. Find out how you can work with NRCS to develop a conservation plan for your operation. Find possible funding resources for implementing conservation practices or get free expert advice on ways to improve your farm or ranch. Visit the website nrcs.usda.gov today. Welcome back to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen as we come to you from Washington, D.C. Traceability has been a topic that's been discussed by beef producers for a very long time. Here to talk more with us about that is Chase DeCoit, who is the Director of Animal Health and Food Safety Policy for NCBA. Chase, why is a traceability program so important to the beef industry? Yeah, Kate, welcome to Washington, D.C., first of all. You know, traceability, like you mentioned, has been something that our industry has discussed for a long time, and for good reason. It's vital that our industry has a robust animal disease traceability program so that we can respond to a potential foreign animal disease outbreak, like, say, foot and mouth disease, rapidly and ensure that our producers can have continuity of business. You know, COVID introduced us all to new topics, things like stop movements. Well, that would be the case if we were to have a potential foreign animal disease outbreak. But if we don't have a robust enough traceability system, we won't be able to return to business. And that could be devastating for our overall economy, but most importantly for our beef producers each and every day and that beef supply chain. So we'd really like to bolster a voluntary animal disease traceability program so that our industry stands at the ready to respond to any sort of disease outbreak. So knowing how important having that plan in place is for beef producers, how can they engage in this process and what are the next steps knowing that everybody's got a, an opinion on this? Yeah, certainly. The first thing you can do is to participate in a voluntary industry-led traceability initiative. And the reason that's so important is the more that we can build the resiliency and the robustness of these voluntary initiatives, the calls for any sort of government run program will quiet down. And the reason that is, is we can show that we have a program that can respond at the ready. And so we really would encourage producers to look into how those disease traceability programs can fit into their business model. That's the next step. It's really a chance for us to take ownership of it in the beef industry, for sure. Um, safe and healthy cattle are something that we know we have and we know our producers have. Uh, what other issues do you all work on here to communicate that to, to legislators and regulators in D.C.? I'm sure there's plenty. Yes, yeah, certainly. As consumers and our regulators become more and more interested in how food is produced, we stand here in Washington, D.C. to talk to those folks about how we raise our cattle and importantly, how we raise a healthy, safe food supply. Now, that starts with healthy cattle. It starts with cattle that are cared for well by programs like the Beef Quality Assurance Program, making sure that they're aware of the self-help programs and our producer education programs that allow us to have the highest standards in animal welfare in the world and make sure that we can also have sound production practices that our producers follow each and every day. So we're here to share that story with our regulators, with those in the supply chain, so that they're aware of what we do on a proactive basis for our cattle. You mentioned production practices, and of course beef producers have a long history of using sound science in their production practices. New technologies are an important aspect of that. FDA just made a major announcement in this regard. Can you tell us about that and what it means? Yeah, our industry has a long history of 
adopting great production practices and innovative technologies. One of those that we've been limited in though is the adoption of biotechnology and gene editing technologies. And the FDA just made a landmark decision that they've approved a product that we'll be able to use in the cattle industry. And that's actually to make an intentional genetic alteration that will allow us to choose for slick haired cattle. Now it's important to know that this gene actually occurs naturally in some breeds of cattle, but we're gonna be able to integrate that into certain breeds that don't have that gene. It's gonna allow us to improve aspects of welfare, cattle health and performance because it'll make these cattle more heat tolerant. Now. This process has been slow because FDA actually has a cumbersome and expensive and slow approval process for gene editing. That's why we'd actually like to see the FDA and the USDA get together to abide by the memorandum of understanding that they both signed at the end of the Trump administration. In that MOU, it would actually transfer the jurisdiction of gene edited technology for farmed animal agriculture and food producing animals from the FDA to the USDA, which is where gene edited technology for crops is already housed. So we're just looking for consistency in this aspect for agriculture and so that we can work with the USDA moving forward to approve more of these products to allow us to adopt these important technologies that our producers can implement. Yeah, a very complicated issue to be sure. And again, you mentioned consistency and that's so important. Thanks to you and your team for all you do to bring that sound science and level-headed approach to the members of Congress. Thanks for being with us today, Chase. Certainly. Kevin, send it back to you. Thanks, Kate. NCBA also engages with Congress and federal agencies on key animal health issues. And joining us now is Dr. Kathy Simmons. She's chief veterinarian at NCBA. Dr. Simmons, people may be surprised to know that NCBA actually has a veterinarian on staff. Why is that so important? Well, first off, Kevin, thanks for the opportunity to be here today on Cattlemen to Cattlemen to talk about animal health issues. I think a top priority for cattlemen and women in the United States is the health and welfare of the cattle under their care. And the ultimate stewards of uh, animal health are veterinarians. Uh, as a veterinarian, um, I've been trained in recognizing and treating animal diseases, uh, as well as basic science. Uh, so the ability to analyze research data, to talk on technical terms on the issues, uh, has been very beneficial. It allows us to interact with our counterparts, other veterinarians, right. at USDA, at FDA, on issues of interest, and also allows us to be on U.S. delegations that go internationally to the World Organization for Animal Health meetings in Paris at the OIE. You mentioned some of those federal agencies, but as you think about both the federal agencies and Congress, uh, tell us more about how you specifically engage with those bodies. Well, we engage both with Congress and the federal agencies on animal health issues. Uh, most of our work, to be quite honest with you, is in the regulatory arena. Okay. Uh, we engage uh, with FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine. We engage with USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and their Food Safety Inspection Service, uh, as well as the Department of Homeland Security. And on public health issues that involve animal health uh, and One Health, we engage with the Centers for Disease Control. So we are really in all arenas. We have a large animal health footprint in Washington, D.C. Uh, and throughout the country, as well as internationally. I've been reading a little bit about these Asian longhorn ticks. What, what are we doing to manage them? Well, the Asian longhorn ticks are a real problem. Um, they were first identified in 2017 in New Jersey on a sheep uh, in a pasture field there. Uh, we think they may have been here as long as 2010. They're an invasion, invasive exotic tick species. Uh, they created a lot of problems in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they originate in East Asia. Uh, and they are unique in that they are three host ticks. Uh, the uh, ticks have a larval stage, a nymph stage, an adult stage, all on a different host, and they will drop off the host and into the environment. So environmental control is huge. But the most important thing about these ticks is they can reproduce asexually which means that a single female can start a population and can lay as much as 2,000 to 4,000 eggs. So you may go into a field where a blade of grass may have 50 of these ticks on it. So this is a real problem as well because there are over 25 hosts that can carry this tick. And that includes birds. So your range 
is really expanded through uh, some of these hosts. Uh, the ticks alone can create problems because there literally will be thousands of these ticks on an animal and a young calf can be exsanguinated in a short period of time. Uh, but the most important problem is they carry an emerging disease called Tyleria orientalis, the Akita genotype. And this is uh, a disease that we have not had in this country. It creates an infectious bovine anemia. Animals are weak, they're febrile. We see abortions, stillbirths. Uh, and they may be persistently infected with this. We have no approved cure for Tyleria in the United States. It's treated with oxytetracycline, and as I say, they may be persistently infected. So it can be a real problem. Very serious problem. Beyond that, what are some of the other top of mind animal health issues that you're working on right now? Well, Kevin, we have a plethora of animal <laughs> health issues. Um, we deal with antibiotic use sure. and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we deal with biotechnology, the gene editing of animals. Yes. Uh, we deal with um, animal disease traceability. Yep. Food safety is in our arena. Mm -hmm. uh, we also deal with basic research uh, with ARS and NEFA mm -hmm. and trying to coordinate that. Uh, so we are kept quite busy, and as I say, we have a large animal health footprint. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the leadership you provide. It's reassuring knowing we have somebody with your expertise right here in Washington, D.C. It's been a pleasure, and thanks for allowing us to speak with you today. You bet. There's more Cattlemen to Cattlemen still ahead, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Nasalgen 3 is a new three-way intranasal BRD vaccine that offers young calves unrivaled protection against devastating respiratory diseases, including IBR, BRSV, and PI3. And it has a unique blue shadow, so there's no second guessing which animals have been vaccinated. To up your protection, choose new Nasalgen 3 PMH, the first and only five-way intranasal vaccine on the market. Talk to your veterinarian and visit nasalgen.com to learn more. If you're connected with the beef cattle business, then you should like the NCBA page on Facebook. The NCBA Facebook page shares photos, news, and valuable information about the beef cattle industry. You can also follow the NCBA Twitter feed at BeefUSA. So stay in touch with NCBA on Facebook and Twitter. have an upcoming production sale to advertise? Then contact the Cattlemen to Cattlemen marketing team or your breed association to learn more. One priority for cattle producers is managing or eliminating anything that negatively impacts the health of your herd. However, sometimes these threats are not easily detected. One example, internal parasites. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter tells us there are four key components of a successful deworming strategy that can build the health and performance of your herd. In Southeast Texas, Howard and Carolyn Davis work together on the San Jacinto Ranch, which has been in Howard's family since the 1800s. Today, they crossbreed their cows with Akayushi bulls, and they place a high priority on herd health, including a strong deworming program. Deworming the cattle is very important to us just to make sure their performance is there. Uh, if, if we've got a mother cow that's, that's spent 60 days with an expensive Akayushi bull, we want to sure, make sure she calves nine months from that time, and, and deworming is one way to do it. When, when their body condition score gets low, uh, that, that calf may not be around. So it, it, it really helps in the performance of the cattle that we've got. Our herd, by and large, is very healthy, and we use the deworming to help keep them that way. We've had very, very high conception rates, almost 100%, and we have almost no 
mortality of the uh, young calves. The deworming is a major component of this because we know that we have parasites in East Texas and it's essential that they stay healthy, that the food that they eat goes for their benefit and not for the worms. Parasites live on the grass cows graze, so deworming is important to cattle producers in all states. Dr. John Davidson of Beringer Ingelheim says animals that are not dewormed will suffer performance loss. Focusing on managing parasites uh, is central to having a, a really strong health program. Ultimately, the impact of parasites in, on cattle uh, are multifactorial. They will impede the uh, transfer of, and absorption of uh, protein and energy and nutrients into, those, uh, into that animal system. And also, one of the least appreciated impacts is on the reproductive efficiency in a set of cattle. Uh, that comes from uh, parasites. And, and even as we're learning more recently, the parasite burdens don't have to be very high to still have a measurable impact on the reproductive performance in a set of females in particular. To help guide cattle deworming strategies, Beringer Ingelheim has developed a four-pillar approach to deworming success. We have a tremendous portfolio of products, but we've matched with that uh, thought leadership in the area of, of helping producers and customers manage um, the long-term sustainability of the products that we have. And so we've, we've rolled out the four pillars of sustainable deworming. The four pillars are uh, diagnostics, combination treatment, pasture management, forage management basically, and refugia. Dr. Davidson says the first pillar, diagnostics, is important so that producers working with their veterinarians can understand exactly where their herd stands in terms of internal parasites. Ultimately, you need to understand the parasites that are in the population of cattle that are going to be treated. The diagnostic evaluation uh, of parasites in cattle is uh, really basic. Uh, you take fecal samples, take them to a reputable laboratory, get the results reported out in a standard fashion. Uh, then you can make decisions on, uh, does anything need to change about that uh, parasite control program? Another critical pillar is combination treatment using more than one class of deworming products. Our deworming program is uh, using two different kinds of dewormer. One of them is the uh, instant, immediate clearing of the gut which is, um, uh, I've heard people call that the white dewormer. And uh, the other one is one that is of a longer duration, but it takes a little bit before it gets into the animal to be effective. Combination treatment really is, is a, a common sense approach to harnessing the best of two different classes of product. Throwing two different mechanisms of killing uh, at that parasite population renders a very high success rate in terms of killing. The benefit of that is, it is you have a population of parasites with very few surviving organisms and uh, you, you delay or minimize any potential for resistance much further down the road. Also important is leaving a small group of animals untreated so parasite resistance to available deworming products does not develop a strategy known as refugia. Refugia is the concept of allowing a, a subset of the cattle in a, in a group to remain untreated and the, the benefit there is you're providing the environment as those cattle shed uh, parasites and, and larvae into the pasture that have not been exposed to the drugs that the rest have been exposed to. Uh, we're maintaining a, the, the genetic information for uh, susceptibility to the drugs that we have in that population. In addition, good pasture and forage management will actually help reduce the internal parasite load in your herd. We rotational graze our cattle. We've got essentially nine pastures, 25, 30 acres a piece, and uh, we'll rotate. And there's no set schedule, but we'll rotate these girls through. Uh, if, they, if we see we're, they're getting down to five or six inches of grass left, we'll move them. Of course, they, they tend to want to move anyway, but we do that, and that tends to kind of keep fresh pastures going. As the pasture is eaten down, as the ground uh, develops more manure, we know it's time to move on so that the animals don't 
then get reinfected with the parasite that we've just spent time killing. And again, that has worked well and we're pleased with the results. Put it all together and the four pillar approach to deworming can ensure that the products producers use will continue to be effective and that the health of their herd will not be reduced by internal parasites. The role that deworming, uh, particularly incorporating uh, the, the four pillar concept and the pasture and livestock stewardship ultimately is gonna contribute in a meaningful way to the health of the cattle while they're at the cow-calf level. The payoff for a good deworming program is that we have healthy animals, we have almost no mortality, we have good weight, and so we have healthy mamas, we have healthy calves, and that's what our customers are wanting, that's where we get our payoff that allows us to keep this ranch going because every penny counts. On the San Jacinto Ranch in Texas, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. To find out more about the four pillar approach to cattle deworming success, visit the website advancedeworming.com. Throughout this episode, we've shown you how the NCBA works in Washington to protect the interest of cattle producing families. But it's important that you understand that the staff in DC aren't the ones who decide what the priority issues are for the beef industry. Those decisions are made by grassroots producers at meetings throughout the year. And there's an important one coming up the Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting, where members of the cattle industry will come together to discuss current issues, work on programs and initiatives, and make plans for the upcoming fiscal year. You can get details on how to attend at the website ncba.org. Well, that wraps up this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD. TV.